Good morning and welcome to the Microlize Group PLC for your results investor presentation. Throughout the recorded meeting, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. Just click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. I'd like to hand you over to Nadim Reza, CEO. Good morning, sir. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for attending today. Um, just a quick a couple of introductions. My name is Nadim Raza. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Microsoft Group PLC. Um, been with the business uh, for, for quite a long time and have done a, a variety of different roles before becoming CEO uh, when we did a management buyout in 2008. Uh, I'll hand across to Nick to introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Nick Whiteman. I'm the CFO for Microsoft Group. Uh, so, and I was appointed CFO uh, in April 2023. Uh, prior to that, I was FD, joined the business in, in 2012 and been involved in a number of the key milestones in, in Mark Rise's recent history, in, including various different acquisitions and, and took a leading role in the IPO back in 2021. Thanks, Nick. Um, just a couple of slides giving you some background uh, for those of you that are new to, to Microlize. Uh, so we're a leading provider of transport management solutions to large enterprise companies. Uh, we sell to uh, lots of smaller companies as well, but the, the large enterprise space is, is, is where we really specialize and where our sweet spot is. Uh, and we help those companies solve complex needs with some of our proprietary software and hardware solutions uh, we help them by automating a lot of their critical processes uh, and giving them that real-time information throughout their operation um, our customers benefit from cost savings uh, reduction in emissions and a whole variety of other efficiencies which we'll talk about in a minute um, there are high barriers to entry uh, and we have a very, very sticky customer base uh, and, and very long-term revenue visibility. Our contracts are typically five years, so hence giving that very long-term visibility of future revenue. Uh, and we have a clear growth strategy, which we'll come on to later on in the, in the slide deck as well. Uh, just in terms of numbers, we've been around since 82. Uh, we have about 715 staff. We have about 400 of those large enterprise uh, customers, as I said, but thousands of, of smaller customers. Uh, we have deployments uh, literally in every country in the world. It's easier to tell you the countries that we're not in. Uh, that's North Korea. Uh, that's it. Uh, we are have uh, systems deployed everywhere else uh, throughout the world. Uh, about 640,000 sub subscriptions. We are a SaaS business, software as a service. Um, uh, and, and as such, uh, people pay us generally on a per vehicle per month price for all the different modules that we sell. And we'll talk about the different modules uh, and our portfolio in a second. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're very sticky with our customer base. We have a very low uh, churn rate. It, it's sub 1%. Uh, and for FY 2023, we turned over 72 million. Uh, we are... Uh, award winning. Uh, we have a number of different awards, uh, including uh, historically, we've won three Queen's Awards for Enterprise in, in 2018, 19, and 20, uh, two of those for innovation and uh, one for uh, international trade. Uh, this is how we help our customers. Um, so we help them by reducing the mileage that vehicles travel by optimizing routes and optimizing exactly what loads go onto what vehicles. Uh, we also monitor drivers uh, and look at exactly how a vehicle is being driven. We have 31 characteristics of driving that we measure and then we can tailor uh, training down to an individual driver that specifically to improve their skill set, that, that individual skill set and the focusing on the areas that they need to, to improve on. Um, of course, if you're driving vehicles better and you're driving them uh, fewer miles, then you also reduce the fuel that you use. Uh, and that also means that you reduce emissions. And, and that's really what earns us the green economy mark from the London Stock Exchange. 
um, by driving vehicles better and, and driving them fewer miles, you also reduce the wear and tear. So there is a, an improvement in, uh, in maintenance uh, costs. Uh, and of course, you have fewer accidents, and that also leads to a reduction in insurance premiums. Uh, not unusual for customers to see uh, a 25% reduction in second year insurance uh, following implementation of our systems. Uh, <coughs> really, what we tend to do is help them improve the, the efficiency and the utilization of their fleet assets, and that's drivers, trailers, vehicles. Uh, etc. So then that enables them to do more deliveries, more loads, more orders uh, with the same number of vehicles and the same number of drivers. Of course, we operate in real time and we uh, eliminate all of that delivery paperwork. Uh, and that means that that real time visibility goes all the way through to the end customer and that enhances the, the customer experience that they're, they're able to provide. Uh, these are locations around, around, the, around the world. Obviously, we now, through acquisitions, have four offices in the, in the UK. Uh, and then we have sales offices in uh, France and in Australia, uh, and a sales and development office in Pune in India, just outside Mumbai. So the highlights of uh, FY 2023 in comparison to uh, FY 22, uh, revenue were, was up 13% to 71.7 million. Uh, recurring revenue was up 11% to 45 million. Uh, just to EBITDA was up 15% to 9.4 million. Uh, we continue to, to grow our uh, ARR uh, up 12% to 47.7 million. Um, and that's reflective of the growth in subscriptions up to 640,000 worldwide, uh, again, up 6.8% on, uh, on last year. Uh, churn remained very low, 0.7%, uh, uh, slightly higher than the uh, churn rate for 2022 uh, at 0.4%, uh, but uh, still extremely low for compared to the industry standard. Uh, cash was up slightly to 16.88 million, and uh, we'll have some more uh, uh, details and color around the financials uh, in Nick's uh, slides shortly. Uh, we're also pleased to announce our, our maiden dividend uh, that will be um, paid at the end of June uh, at 1.725 pence per share. Just to explain a little bit more about what we do, uh, this is a, uh, a slide showing the different groups of modules within our portfolio. We have lots and lots of modules, but we group them into, into these um, seven categories. Uh, we'll start off from the right-hand side here and uh, talk about fleet safety. And you'll notice that the, the orange uh, icons there. They they're the different companies that we've acquired uh, over uh, the the last couple of years and uh, illustrate which parts of the product portfolio uh, they fall into or, or or actually contribute to. So fleet safety is is all about uh, trying to reduce accidents and and deal with accidents when they do occur. So we have modules there such as. Uh, incident data recording, a bit like a, a uh, an air, airplane uh, black box recorder. Uh, we also have bridge strike avoidance applications. So if you're uh, operating a lorry of a particular height, we can warn you uh, if you're approaching a bridge that you can't get under. Uh, and obviously, multi-camera solutions. So we have cameras uh, externally on the vehicle, looking all around the vehicle, and as well as cameras inside the vehicle, either looking at the load or uh, looking at the the driver to monitor for distractions or driver fatigue. Uh, then we'll move on to fleet performance. Uh, so fleet performance is uh, what you probably understand as vehicle tracking and telematics. Uh, so people often compare us with other tracking and telematics companies, but as you can see from from this slide, uh, tracking and telematics is is a is a very small part of our overall product set, uh, and it's really in this group of modules that uh, we provide that uh, telemetry. 
and that includes monitoring of the vehicle and where it is but also uh, things like temperature monitoring door sensing weight sensing etc as well uh, then we have a compliance module uh, which again covers all of the rules and regulations that you have to adhere to when you're operating a fleet of trucks uh, that includes the the uh, historical recording of, of any kind of maintenance and regular safety checking that you have to do on a truck, uh, as well as monitoring of all of the driving hours regulations that you have to adhere to as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then uh, in the darker blue here, we have our journey management solution and connected driver connected mobility. So these two elements really deal with the execution piece uh, of the portfolio. So uh, once you are actually uh operating uh in day uh with a plan uh and trying to deliver a variety of goods lots of things can go wrong and it's about making sure that you deal with those issues if you're going to uh, get stuck in traffic or if you're going to be delayed in making a delivery being able to notify the customer automatically uh that that uh, that that delay is happening uh and also dealing with other scenarios such as um uh being uh, not able to deliver because uh, the customer wasn't there or or there was some kind of damage to the goods in transit <coughs> and then on the left hand side uh, we have our transport management system uh, which really made up of the two acquisitions that we've done in the last few months uh, with Vita and ESS uh, they really form part of the the transport management system, which is which I'll explain in, on the next slide in terms of what that actually does, and then planning and optimization, which is uh, a product that we've developed ourselves internally over the last few years, uh, which is all to do with uh, planning the the loads, the vehicles, the drivers, and ensuring that you are uh, doing your collections and your deliveries in the most efficient way using the least amount of vehicles, least amount of drivers uh, and and least amount of, of fuel and mileage uh, to do to do all of those deliveries. So I'm going to go on and explain now a bit more about uh, the acquisitions that we've done in the last uh, period, uh, mainly ESS Vita in the TMS space and Flare k-safe uh, in the fleet safety space so ess and uh, vita uh, actually operate in the transport management systems space and and that really deals with the front end of uh, uh, of, of how you deal with your customers in terms of quoting for work, uh, dealing with order receipts and, and actually processing of those orders. So when you get some work in, in terms of taking some pallets from place A to B, um, working out exactly how much you're going to charge for that. Uh, you may have special rates with customers. You may also have special rates with subcontractors if you need to subcontract that work out to somebody else. Uh, dealing with that, deciding what the best way of, of of dealing with that potential order and quoting for that. And then if that work is ordered, uh, working out exactly the most efficient and cost-effective way of, uh, of uh, uh, executing that order as well. Uh, then there's obviously load planning. If you're running a multi-depot operation, deciding which depot you might fulfill an order from uh, or potentially fulfill an order from multiple depots. Uh, planning what resources you're going to use, drivers, vehicles, trailers, subcontractors in some cases, couriers in some cases, uh, multimodal operations in some cases as well. Um, and then, of course, dispatching uh, that order and dealing with returns, re-deliveries, uh, in the case of failed deliveries, uh, collecting the evidence of deliveries, dealing with any kind of, uh, any kind of additional costs that you may have incurred and how you're going to pass those on to the customer and of course then dealing with the the final invoicing and cash collection as well so uh, a whole set of functionality that is uh, a great addition into our portfolio then we come on to ksafe and their product called flare uh, so they sell flare to uh, large enterprises that uh, operate in the two-wheel uh, vehicle space. So 
Uh, on the left-hand side, people like Lime, Tier, and Voy, who operate uh, e-bikes and e-scooters. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, their customers include people like Just Eat uh, and Deliveroo, who are operating the, the last mile delivery uh, solution. And the Flare business model breaks down into, into two segments, really. Uh, on the left-hand side, to companies that operate those large fleets of bikes, et cetera, they provide a uh, loan worker safety solution uh, and an automatic accident detection solution. And of course, they do risk scoring, which uh, helps with uh, first notification of loss and also insurance cost reduction as well. So that's something that they sell to um, those large enterprises that run those large fleets of, of bicycles and, and, and e-scooters. And those are those are charged on a you know the model there is charged on a per ride or a per journey basis. So again, a, a very much a SaaS uh, type offering. Uh, and then on the right hand side, uh, the that data is also used in our more traditional truck space in providing uh, an application for truck drivers that uh, gives them uh, proximity warnings and hazard warnings relating to cyclists in close proximity and in blind spots around the truck. Um, so this is a, a, an application that we developed uh, jointly with Flair over the last 18 months uh, prior, to, prior to acquiring the business. This slide gives you a range of our uh, other customers. Uh, not all of the customers are on here, but it gives you a view that um, you know, the, the, the wide amount of really household brand names that we operate with um, and across a wide set of different industry sectors as well. So a very diverse range of, of customers and industry sectors. Uh, and again, there's a link there at the bottom of the, of the slide that you can go to to uh, uh, see further case studies uh, if you're interested in understanding how we, we help those uh, different types of customers. Some of the main highlights of 2023, uh, obviously we, we acquired three businesses uh, uh, over the period uh, with ESS completing uh, just after the period in, in the middle of January. Uh, we've been successful uh, with cross-selling and upselling those uh, new products into our existing customers. We've sold four TMS contracts uh, last year uh, and also one to a, a brand new customer as well. Um, We've had really good growth in uh, ANZ. It's our fastest growing region. Um, and with the win uh, of the Woolworths contract, which we announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of our largest contract wins, uh, that means that we have the top three retailers in, in Australia. Uh, and again, we're hoping to replicate the success that we've had in the retail segment in the UK, where we have a 90% market share. We've continued to uh, have accreditation for a great place to work uh, for the second year. Uh, so we're really proud of our uh, employee engagement. Um, and we've continued to uh, have that very low churn rate, which has meant uh, we've had over 40 major multi-year renewals with the likes of Bidfood, Palex, Tesco, uh, Sainsbury's and Semex. Um, traditionally, Customers tend to renew for uh, five years, uh, and it's also uh, an area and an opportunity where we're able to upsell additional modules uh, into those customer contracts as well. Uh, over the last few years, we've also been focusing on that middle tier uh, of, of uh, business customers. So uh, for us, uh, an enterprise customer is somebody with over 500 vehicles. Um, but more recently, we've also been focusing at the sort of 200 to 500 vehicle fleet size segment as well. And we've had great success with that. In 2022, uh, we we onboarded 250 new customers in that segment. Uh, and in the, the last 12 months, we've onboarded 450 new customers in that segment. So really good progress in that middle tier uh, of enterprise customers as well. 
where we've been making uh, further investments and we plan to continue to make investments in, in 2024, uh, security is, uh, is, a, is a big concern and, and something very important to our customers. Uh, we've seen a number of logistics companies fall victim to uh, ransomware attacks and, and not survive. Uh, and uh, we've seen about five or six companies in the last year um, uh, effectively going into rece receivership shortly after ransomware attacks. Uh, fortunately, none of them have been our customers. Um, and so uh, uh, it's something that our customers are very aware of and very keen to ensure that we are looking after their data. And that's really uh, part of the reason why we've uh, been spending quite a lot of money on improving our security uh, posture. Uh, of course, we have, with our acquisitions, uh, onboarded a number of new products, uh, and that means that we are working on integrating those products into the portfolio in a, in a very seamless way to provide a consistent customer experience. Uh, we're branding that product Microlize Complete, um, which uh, essentially covers all of the different types of operations that uh, a logistics operation would need uh, functionally. Uh, uh, and so we're doing more work on that in 2024. Uh, of course, we continue to innovate, continue to innovate with new products. Um, and another form, another part of our strategy is to increase the number of third-party hardware products that we support. Um, we want to make sure that a large capex spend is not a blocker for a customer uh, in terms of buying our software. Uh, uh, and where they already have lots of hardware in place that, that that are working, we don't want to force them into into having to replace that hardware with our hardware, just so that they can use our software. Uh, so by implementing more support for third-party hardware, uh, we're going to remove that blocker uh, from them. We already support quite a few different third-party products, um, but we intend to increase that support in 2024, and thereby uh, increasing uh, the software sales that. Uh, uh, will enable us to to sell into those customers. I'm going to hand across to Nick now to give some more detail on the finance side. Thank you, Nadine. So th this this slide is is our um, recurring revenue cohort analysis, which shows that that we consistently grow customer revenues year on year. Um, as we've pointed out in the headlines, we have a very low um, uh, churn rate. So customer retention is, is very, very high. Uh, existing customer uh, revenue uh, equated for around 98% of our total recurring revenues in, in 2023. So what that does is gives us really, really good visibility for our forecasting and planning. Um, obviously, we, we expect uh, growth to continue. Obviously, some of the initiatives that we've called out already in terms of integration, um of both existing and and further um, and of the recent acquisitions will will obviously give us the opportunity to cross sell and upsell even more and, and make us even more sticky and difficult to replace with our customers in terms of our revenue revenue breakdown um we consider ourselves as a software company uh, but there are other elements to our revenue as you can see here if you look at the graph on the right hand side um, it is broken down into three main components. Uh, the bottom component in blue uh, is, the, is the software subscriptions. So that equates for around 63% of our total revenue. Um, please say that's we've seen continual growth in, in our recurring revenues over the last five years. Um, it grew 11% year on year to 45 million. Uh, the orange segment is, is the hardware. That, that's grown around about 10% this year to 20 million. Uh, and the final uh, segment is the um, is the services segment, and that's grown by around forty six percent to six point eight million pounds in the year. Um, the, the services segment is broken up into two main elements. Sorry, three main elements. We've got uh, professional services in terms of um, project management. We've got professional services in terms of uh, integration work, and we also have engineering installations. Um, what we saw. Uh, in, in the second half of 2023, 
Um, you may recall in our in our half year announcement, we, we pointed out that we had a significant increase in our on hand order book. It effectively doubled to around 10 million pounds. Uh, that really was a result of us being unable to deploy uh, new contract wins because of customer vehicle availability. Uh, that subsided considerably towards the back end of the year, and we really started to roll that out in in Q4. So as a result, we did we saw quite a significant increase in in direct customer activity. Uh, and what you tend to find with uh, direct customer activity is they're normally retrofitted. So our engineers will have to go out and, and retrofit retrospectively install to the fleet. And there's also other services like the project management that we need to sort of effectively coordinate these installations because they tend to be quite large in nature and obviously quite complex because fleets fleets do move around quite a bit. So I think the other thing to point out is the we've, we've continued to see very, very strong demand for our OEMs. So we, we saw a record year in 2022. We've seen another record year in 2023. Uh, and we do expect that to continue uh, into 2024 and beyond. Just moving on to the profit and loss account. Uh, so we've covered off revenue that we, we saw overall, we saw a 13.5% increase year on year. Um, gross margin uh, increased 16% year on year. Uh, we saw increases in our gross margin percentage in both non-recurring and recurring revenues. Um, the non-recurring revenues was, um, we, we, we saw a, a move towards um, a greater proportion in, in the second half of the year of the direct customer rollouts, as I've just mentioned. In terms of the um, recurring revenues and the margins associated to those, um, we really put a lot of focus on, on rationalizing third party services that we use. So within our products, we use um, things like um, map providers, obviously airtime, we have mobile device management solutions, etc. And we've put a lot of work into rationalizing those in terms of both from an operational standpoint and also from a commercial perspective. Um, overall, um, revenues, sorry, operating margins increased from uh, 60% to 61%. Um, so that, that was impacted by a greater proportion of, of hardware in, in the second half of the year. So normally we would expect, you know, if we're seeing those kind of increases in, in the recurring revenues, that margins would would be higher. But, you know, that, that that's a consequence of, of rolling out the order book that we had at the back end of um, the, the second half of last year. Uh, operating expenses increased 16% to 35 million. The vast majority of that was related to employee costs. So we, we've continued to invest uh, significantly in our sales force, you know, and that's globally. Um, we have um, sales forces in, 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 in uh, Australia as well as France and obviously the UK. Uh, we tend to split the sales force into two. So we have an account management team that focuses um, exclusively on existing customers and cross-selling and upselling into those customer bases to get a bigger share of the wallet. And we also have a dedicated team to win a new business. Uh, in addition to that, we've, we've obviously continued to invest in uh, the product and development roadmap, uh, as well as security, which is obviously something that is gonna be ongoing moving forward, given the, the, the things that Nadine's pointed out. Adjusted EBITDA increased 15% to 4, 9 .4 million from 8.2 in the previous year. Um, margin increased slightly to 13.2 to 13%. Um, efficiency and margin uh, enhancement is something that we are really focused on internally. Uh, so we've got programs of work that are going on in 24 and they will be ongoing into 25 and beyond. Um, and that really is around making sure that our internal processes are streamlined and optimized and, and where possible automated to make the business more scalable so we can continue to grow the business without adding additional overhead. Um, in addition to that, um, part of the M&A strategy that we've adopted is to really seek out um, high value software solutions. So um, Vita and, and uh, ESS fall into that bracket. So you know, the, the subscription per asset per month is is very much at, at the very higher end, which will obviously will, will go to drop down and increase margins naturally. In addition, those those two businesses are uh, predominantly software. So, you know, that there isn't any uh, non-recurring services to, to the extent that we see for the, the wider group. 
And in addition to that, there's the um, the integration to third party products that Nadim re referred to on the previous slide. Um, the, the Woolworths win in Australia that we recent an recently announced was, um, you know, a testament to the work that we've done there. Uh, we rolled out a very successful proof of concept uh, middle of last year. Uh, and, and that was a, the precursor for the rollout across their entire fleet. And that was really around the, the AI cameras and the anti-distraction cameras that have been you know, received very, very well and, and proved to really solve the business case for the customer. In terms of cash flow, uh, we are a cash generative business. Uh, so we, we converted 98% of our adjusted EBITDA into cash in the year. That would have been higher uh, if it wasn't for a couple of uh, customers paying us late in the year. So we, we, we had about 1.2 million that, that uh, landed with us very early in 2024. Uh, so if we if we adjust for that, it would be around 111 percent. Um, we've invested more in the year in in fixed assets. So predominantly that is around investment in the infrastructure. So within the data centers, but also within um, the internal business systems to um, upgrade hardware. We have an ongoing hardware upgrade program that that is uh, that we that we replace on a rolling basis um, on a, on a continual basis uh, but we've also invested additional funds into security so network and, and other safeguarding uh, firewalls etc is, is something that you know we're, we're having to increase the level of capital allocation in that area and we'll, we will have to continue to do that in in, in future years as well um, i think it's fair to point out that the comparative period where it says a million pounds in fixed asset investment was, was abnormally low um, and that that was really because the um, the IT sector was was suffering from the same component shortages that we'd seen in, in the vehicle sector. So uh, it, it's a bit of a low base point, but I think the point is is that we we're going to continue to see capex levels that that we're that we're seeing here. Um, intangible assets is is really around um, internally generated uh, software IP. So. That, that's increased year on year as, as a reflection of the the integration work that we're doing uh, with with the existing platform, but also the newly acquired platforms, uh, and also ongoing investment again into into security as well as the infrastructure and, and product roadmap. M um, and A spend obviously has increased in the year to three million uh, from from the one million in the previous year, and that is driven by by the two acquisitions of. of um, KSafe in December and also the, the Vita software uh, acquisition in, in March 2023. The remaining 1 million was the uh, third and final deferred consideration to uh, the, the, the previous shareholders of TrueTag that we acquired in, in March 2020. I think the final thing to point out from a cash perspective is, is that we last week we renewed our uh, HSBC facility uh, on more favourable terms. So, so the margins and effectively what they what they charge us to have the facility in place is, is reduced. Uh, I think that's re as a reflection of, of the business's, um, you know, strong credit status. Um, we took the decision to reduce the RCF from twenty million down to ten million, uh, and that really was because we we feel that we we are able to generate enough cash internally to, um, you know, continue to invest in the, in the key strategic areas. Um, so, but what we have managed to add into the facility this time that wasn't in there previously was uh, the addition of an accordion, which means effectively we have access to approximately 40 million pounds worth of funds to support our strategic initiatives moving forward. I'll just uh, move on to the next slide and I think I'll hand back to you, Nadine. Thanks, Nick. Um, so just a couple of slides on, on what's going on in our uh, customer space and in our uh, in our uh, space as well. So what we're seeing in our customers market is that it's still uh, pretty competitive and, and tough out there for them. Um, so they're continuing to look for ways of increasing efficiency and reducing their costs. Uh, there is pressure mounting in terms of net zero uh, and reducing emissions. We have scope through reporting coming along and um, more activity now on accurately reporting uh, emissions uh, across uh, different aspects of their operational businesses. 
Uh, health and safety and compliance continue to increase. Uh, some new standards and some new rules and regulations coming in in 2024 and next year as well. Uh, <coughs> and our customers continue to invest in alternative fuels. So uh, I've seen good growth in electric vehicle fleets uh, and replacement programs in the smaller truck space. Uh, and in the larger trucks, it's still very much diesel or diesel and gas. Uh, there are a few trials going on with hydrogen, uh, but it's still very embryonic at this point in time. Uh, the important thing to say is uh, whatever type of technology, uh, vehicle technology customers uh, decide to, to buy, uh, we already support all of those, uh, including hydrogen. Uh, and with regards to the other uh, pressures they're facing in terms of complexity and, and reducing cost uh, and also uh, emissions monitoring and health and safety compliance. Uh, that's what our products are geared towards. Uh, we can solve all of those different types of requirements that uh, customers are coming to us with. And, and we continue to work very closely with our customers and deal with any future uh, uh, issues that crop up as well. In terms of our own operational environment, um, last year at this time we were talking still about uh, component shortages and supply chain issues. Uh, we projected that they would uh, diminish by uh, the second half of 2023 uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we, we saw that happen last year. Uh, we also said that the availability of new vehicles would probably be one to two quarters uh behind that curve uh and again we're seeing that um uh borne out as well and uh as we speak now we're we're kind of back to normal levels of pre-pandemic levels of, of lead times on new trucks uh we're seeing some inflationary pressures coming through from our suppliers but largely that's netting out through price increases that we're passing through to our end customers um and uh, we still see very strong demand for our products, particularly with our recent acquisitions uh, uh, and some of our new uh, enhancements, such as the AI, AI cameras, where we've seen a lot of good traction in, in, uh, in other geographies as well as the UK, particularly in ANZ. So our growth strategy uh, remains consistent. Um, we on, we're continuing to uh, cross-sell uh, and upsell into our existing customers. Um, we're seeing good growth with our OEMs. We are involved with over 35 new uh, vehicle models for, for launching later this year and the beginning of next year with JCB uh, and uh, a variety of new models with MAN trucks as well. Um, when it comes to new customer wins, again, we're doing very well on that front as well with uh, customer wins in, in the UK and Ireland with people like McCullough, LFE, &E, Creed, uh, PD Ports, etc. Um, and international wins uh, like Woolworths and Metcash in, in Australia. And uh, really good growth in that medium-sized fleet segment with over 450 new customer wins in that space. Uh, and layered upon that uh, organic growth, um, we have uh, three acquisitions that we've done recently. Uh, and by no means, that is not the end of our M&A story. We continue to look for, for further opportunities uh, for businesses that can uh, in, enhance our product set further uh, or give us a, an increase in our geographic footprint internationally. And so moving on to the investment case. So as I mentioned earlier, we are a we are a SaaS business and our typical contracts are five years. Uh, in fact, we have some contracts that are eight years and some contracts that are 10 years. So again, really, really good long term visibility of, of future contracted revenue uh, that combined with uh, really low customer churn uh, again, 0.7 percent. Um, uh, means that uh, you know we are we are very sticky and uh, really confident about our future forecasts. Um, we sell multiple products uh, and a wide product set into into existing customers. That makes us very sticky 
and also quite difficult to substitute. Uh, we've got further work going on in terms of margin enhancement with new products and improvements in our supply chain and our uh, direct customer sales. Uh, and there is significant market opportunity, um, particularly internationally, where we're really only scratching the surface. And we've also got a, a track record of consistently growing. Um, as you can see from the graph on the right hand side, we've had six years of, of of consistent growth in our recurring revenues um, and we're expecting 2024 to, to be along similar lines. And then moving on to uh, outlook statement, as I said, we've had a, a strong performance in 2023. Some of the headwinds that we've seen over the last two years with supply chain issues and long lead times on new vehicles uh, slowing us down have, have diminished. Uh, we have OEM customers with uh, strong forecasts going forwards and continuing to break uh, volume records. Uh, we've, we've grown significantly with a lot of new wins in the last year. Uh, and of course, we should see some uh, accretive uh, revenue and, and margins coming through in 2024 from the acquisitions that we've just completed in 2023. So. We're looking forward to an exciting 2024 uh, and we're confident of meeting our market expectations and with that i'll hand back to chet for a minute uh, sorry i'll hand back to paul for a second fantastic nadine nick look thanks indeed for the presentation um ladies and gentlemen do please continue to submit your questions just using that q a tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today i'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published q a can be accessed via your invested dashboard um as you can see we've had a number of questions submitted uh, throughout today's presentation and thank you to all the investors who have submitted those um if i may just ask you just to click on that q a tab and where appropriate to do so just read out the question and uh, give your response and I'll pick up from you at the end. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, so first question from Stephen, uh, with a focus on international expansion evident in recent contracts, what are the challenges and how big are the opportunities you see here? Uh, is this a case of just a sales function reselling core product? Um, so in, in some cases, in some geographies, that is the case. Um, Australia, obviously we don't have issues with language in, compar in comparison to France. Um, but there are product enhancements that we have to do. Australia, for example, is still a different currency. Uh, it has uh, five different time zones um, where you know operations have to deal with the with uh, deliveries, etc., that go across time zone boundaries. Um, there are different types of uh, of transportation, particularly with large um, truck. Uh, trains that they have with uh, with multiple uh, box cars on the back of a uh, being pulled by the same uh, tractor unit. So th there are a variety of differences, uh, and so localizations is an area that we do uh, invest some R and D spend in into uh, to make sure that our products are appropriate and solving the problems that, that exist within a particular geography. Um, Sometimes we have to do more of that than in other areas. So Australia, uh, we have to do some. Uh, France and, and in other parts of Europe, we have to do a lot more uh, because there are a lot more uh, variety of different types of transport operations in, in, in those regions. Um, but generally speaking, it, it's about having more salespeople on the ground and they have to be local within country to, uh, to be able to go off and, and make those sales. So that's why we're continuing to invest both in our sales and in our marketing in each of those regions. Uh, the next question from uh, Ben was to do with, uh, says, you look to have increased the pace of acquisitions in this. Is this something we can expect to continue versus organic expansion? Um, I think we remain consistent with our view on M&A, which is that uh, it's important to make the right deal um and that means that that you know the product set has to has to fit uh the cultural aspects of the business have to fit uh the numbers have to have to fit uh, and it has to tick those important boxes of you know does it enhance our product set is it accretive does it uh enhance our geographic footprint in some way um so there's a number of things that have to be right 
uh, for us to to proceed with a with a, uh, an M and A deal. Um, so uh, we I can't I can't say I can't sit here and say that we we're, we're going to do five or six in the next year. I I don't think that's that's uh, appropriate for me to make that kind of comment. Um, but uh, what I can say is that we are still very much active. Uh, on the M&A front, and we are looking for uh, businesses that meet our criteria. And our criteria hasn't changed, uh, and and you know we, we'll continue to um, uh, look for uh, businesses and make sure that we are doing the right deal rather than just a deal. Um, <clears throat> the next question is from Andrew. It says, uh, "What rate of organic growth does the company believe it can achieve?" Given the large number of enterprise customers, is geographic expansion required to achieve this? Uh, what operational leverage does company exhibit and what are implications for EBITDA margins? So a, a few different points there. I think the first point is that uh, we believe that our organic growth uh, can be better than um, we've seen in 2022 and 2023. And that's really um, given that, that we had a number of headwinds over those periods. and uh, and so we're focusing on 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 um, improving our organic growth in 2024. Uh, I think that it's uh, going to be a combination of geographic uh, expansion as well as more wins in the UK. Uh, so I think both of those things will apply. Uh, and in terms of operational leverage um, and implications for EBITDA margins, so we are very focused on increasing our EBITDA margins. Um, we know that they can be higher and part of that is the consequence of, of uh, the mix that we sell. So um, hardware obviously has far lower margins than software services. Uh, and so where we sell lots and lots of hardware, uh, particularly to OEMs and particularly towards the end of last year, direct to customers, um, through the backlog of orders that we had, um, that tends to depress margins. Um, the the work that we're doing in investing in high value, higher margin products and selling more of those, uh, combined with support for third party hardware such that uh, we can implement our software without having to sell new hardware to a customer, all of those things will help increase uh, and grow our margin percentage. Uh, the next question is on share-based payments, and Nick, I don't know if you want to answer that question. Sure, yeah, I can pick that up, Nadim. Um, so, share-based payments seem, uh, seem an issue for me as a shareholder. Can you explain fully what these uh, what these are and who they are for? So, the there's a long-term incentive scheme in place for the uh, executive team and the senior management team, which consists of eight people. So there are share uh, share options issued. Uh, what well, the, the strategy is that we'll that we'll issue them each year uh, for uh, for those individuals. They are based on two main performance criteria, which are total shareholder return. Uh, so effectively, that is that is share price, uh, and obviously now the newly introduced dividend as well. Uh, but we've also introduced a, um, a carbon reduction metric as well. So 90% of the recent options are allocated to uh, share price performance and 10% is the uh, carbon reduction uh, target. Uh, they've increased because um, effectively what we've done since IPO is, is issued a set of options each year. So uh, because they are, there's a three year vesting period effectively, we, we, we've kind of done one in 21, one in 22 and one late in 23. And then effectively, the, the ones that were issued in 2021 will now drop off. So in essence, what we're saying is, is that, that that share price, the, the share based payment charge should stay at a similar level to what it what it's what it's now at. I think it's important to say that this isn't a cash payment. Uh, this is purely an accounting payment based on the options. OK, um, I think. Um... Next question is from Neville about the splits uh, of revenue growth between uh, price and volume. I, I don't think I can give you an accurate figure on that, but I'd say the majority, the vast majority of uh, the growth uh, was down to 
uh, uh, increasing volume or selling more to existing customers or new customers rather than just a, uh, a price increase coming through. Okay, if I can just interject on that. So uh, effectively, we're, we're seeing of the 11% uh, annual recurring revenue, around 3% of that 11% will be down to price in inflationary uh, um, increases. Okay. Uh, next one's from Thierry. Uh, why don't you expense your software development costs rather than capitalizing them to provide a better view of your EBITDA? Uh, I think it's fair to say that a large majority of our development is actually uh, expensed rather than capitalized. I don't know if you want to say any more on that, Nick. Uh, yeah, well, un under the um, international financial accounting standards, you, you have to capitalize development costs. You can't expense it. So that's predominantly the reason why why we uh, why we capitalize it. Okay. Uh, another question from Thierry, could you please comment on your pricing strategy on your various modules? It's, yeah, so it's it's um, it varies a lot across the different modules. Obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on the ones on the right-hand side picture that you saw, uh, I'll try and go back to it. Um, here, um, the, the ones in the lighter blue shade are heavily commoditized there's lots of competition out there um lots of people doing similar sorts of things and they've been around for 15 years or so uh, those particular modules so um you know that that solution space is very well served and so those you know products you're looking at anywhere between sort of five and 15 pounds per vehicle per month as a price whereas uh products on the left hand side the planning and optimization and transport management system side in the market, you're looking at uh, you know between 50 and 100 pounds per vehicle per month uh, type pricing for some of those some of those modules. So, again, you know we're investing very much more on the products on the left hand side and bringing more of those types of products to our portfolio, uh, thereby enhancing our top line and or also our uh, EBITDA margins. <coughs> um, okay, uh, next question uh from darren please can you comment on the average fleet size and the difference in margins etc of winning contracts with smaller businesses uh smaller businesses tend to have higher uh we you tend to be able to gener generally speaking uh sell them at a slightly higher price um however the cost of sales is also uh far far higher in proportion to the revenue spend as well so there are particular sizes of fleets that we just don't go down to. So it's very, very unusual for us to directly sell to anybody sort of below 100 vehicles. We do have um, effectively OEM reseller channels uh, and a couple of other reseller channels where some products are sold to smaller fleets. Uh, but, but generally, as a business, we tend to operate in a 100 vehicle fleet segment and up. up. <laughs> um, Thierry asks, could you please comment on the go to market and direct and indirect strategy? Uh, most of our, in most cases, we operate um, selling direct to customers. There are a few resellers for certain products, uh, particularly in the fleet compliance space uh, and in the fleet performance space. Um, but the products like planning and optimization and TMS uh, and journey management driving connection with us, we tend to sell direct because they're not very easy for a uh, for a reseller to sell on. Uh, most resellers sell the simpler product on the right-hand side of this slide. Darren asks, what's the impact of CapEx spending on security firewall, et cetera, and how will this change over time? Um, uh, I'm just conscious of time, so I'll keep, quickly give you a, a simple answer to this, which is that uh, we we expect to continue to spend in, in, in that security uh, area this year. We don't expect the and be higher than it was last year, um, but nevertheless, you know, we are we are continuing to invest in that space because that's what our what our customers expect of us. Uh, next one from Darren: Do all new contract wins require hardware updates, and what is the split in new hardware and the use of third-party hardware? Um, no, they don't require uh, new hardware. Um, in a lot of cases. 
particularly where we're renewing, uh, customers tend to reuse the, continue using the hardware that we've already supplied them. Uh, we support hardware for a very long time. Uh, I'm talking eight, nine, 10 years. Usually our hardware outlasts the vehicle itself. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we, we continue providing support for hardware for quite a long time. Uh, the exception to that is in the handheld devices uh, and that's really down to security uh, concerns. Android operating systems um, that are deployed on them don't tend to offer security patches beyond sort of five or six years. Uh, and so that really tends to be the reason why customers have to replace handhelds. But a lot of our other sensors and other devices tend to last uh, a, a very long time. And as I said, uh, tend to outlast the actual vehicle itself. Uh, Another question from Thierry. Are you sure that saying you are a SaaS business is the best way to stress you have a strong recurring revenue base? Um, well, I think by definition, we, we are, uh, you know, we are a we are a SaaS business in terms of the way that we sell things. We are we do sell them as a service uh, uh, and consistent to other software businesses. We tend to sell either by uh, licensing by vehicle, uh, by by person, uh, by driver, uh, and there are a few parts of our product portfolio that is done on a per order or per transaction basis. But essentially, we we host all of our software and we provide it as a service to end customers, uh, and hence we tend to describe ourselves that way. And we are very focused on growing our recurring revenue. Uh, that's also important to say that we expect that to continue to, to grow successfully as it has done over the last five, six years. Um, I think just going through some of the other, uh, questions, uh, I think a question of from Bill, how much of your revenue is generated outside the UK and why are you concentrating on countries on the other side of the world, like Australia, rather than potential clients in continental Europe? So, uh, it, it's quite difficult to look at our strategy accounts and look at exactly how much of our revenue is, is generated outside of the UK because a lot of our deals are with UK companies that then deploy our software and solutions internationally. Um, Nick, I don't know if you can give a, 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 a statutory figure. So for, the, the statutory uh, number is around 8%. Uh, is international yeah, and 92% yeah. is, yeah, is, is UK based. based. Yeah. yeah, I think in, in, in reality, the international revenue is probably higher than that if you actually looked at where, where we're actually deployed, but that's the statutory number. Uh, the reason why we ended up in Australia is is, is mainly twofold. One, uh, it's English speaking, uh, and, and two, a lot of our retail um, contacts from the UK uh, have historically emigrated over to Australia and run businesses like Woolworths, like Coles. Uh, you find that some of the senior management in those organisations are people from the UK who have emigrated over there and who have then uh, looked at those businesses and said, well, you should just be deploying these tools that, um, you know, that they've already deployed very successfully in the UK market. Uh, and that's really the reason why we've ended up in, in those geographies. But but that's by no means to say that we aren't um, interested in, in Europe. We absolutely are. And, and we continue to see Europe as being a, a great opportunity for us going forward. Um, I think that's the end of the questions that we can, we can cover at this time. So back to Paul. Fantastic. Look, thank you for taking so many of the questions and thanks to all the investors for submitting those. And of course, the company can review any further questions that are submitted. And we publish responses where appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. And before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you and the company, Nadine, could I just ask you just for a few closing comments, please? Yeah. So uh, firstly, thank you everyone for attending the presentation. Um, if you do have any further questions, then you can reach us through uh, a number of other means. Uh, and um, yeah, we look forward to an exciting uh, 2020, 2024, and uh, we will uh, obviously update you further uh, with our half year results in the coming months. Fantastic. Nadine, Nick, thanks indeed for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close the session as you're automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and that is greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Microlize Group at PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session and good morning to you all. Thank you. Thank you.